Ren from Hallowed Be Thy King. And today I'm sharing with you my deep dive discussion on Tales of Arise. Let's check it out. For today's discussion, I cover a wide range of topics. If there's a particular section you're looking for, be sure to check the description for timestamps. Before the release of Tales of Asperia Definitive Edition, Tales of Arise would begin development in 2018 under the codename Arise, bringing with it a number of changes in combat structure and presentation. Tales of Arise leaves its own distinct mark on the franchise while simultaneously making a strong appeal to new fans. At the time of this discussion, Tales of Arise has already exceeded 1 million sales, and it's becoming a modern-day juggernaut for action JRPGs. Story and Characters We join the tale of Arise as the world is being plagued by oppression and 300 years of slavery. We follow the struggles of Alfin and Shion to break the Renan stranglehold on Alfin's homeworld of Dana. As the party begins to travel across the five realms, we see the different cultures and ecosystems that range from barren desert mesas to vibrant, lush countrysides. Some of the areas of Tales of Arise are a contender for the most beautiful and awe-inspiring scenery I have ever seen in video games. The journey across these lands are very well written, and what could be a trite and repetitive story instead leaves a unique mark as we witness the party struggle with their own biases and overcome overwhelming odds as they desperately try to rise above fate. The themes and issues presented in Tales of Arise are deep and thought-provoking. I felt the writing was really well done, and outside of one event in the game involving Law and Renwell, I felt the game never delved too deeply into anime tropes. I have fallen head over heels with this cast of characters, and I can honestly say that I don't understand some of the hate I've been hearing for the voice actors. Major props to all the main cast and Zephyr. Legit love their performances, Alfin is incredible. His voice is aged and gruff, breaking away from the typical JRPG hero mold. While his relationship with Xion carries a charming amount of realism as they grow closer to one another while dealing with the pain they both feel. Also, Kasara, good loud Jesus, Kasara. She is fantastic. And there's one scene that I'm not going to spoil for you where she did such an over-the-top incredible job that I'm still thinking about how painful and beautiful the scene is. One of my favorite themes explored in Tales of Arise is the theme of rising above the pain of your past. The cast may struggle with an enormous amount of pain or hatred, but they all have to rise above these struggles or be consumed by them. It's beautiful. And I mean this with all my heart when I say that Tales of Arise story and cast of characters are instant classics to me. This is coming from someone who loved Vesperia, but Tales of Arise is a monolith in the Tales series. Music. Don't believe the hate that you'll hear from the major review sites. The music is beautifully written, wonderfully paced, and evokes a wide range of emotions. I love the themes that play for the different intros in the game, and when the stakes are at their highest, the orchestral songs are on point. The battle track is not repetitive, and it gets right to the action. The ambient music that plays while you explore the jaw-dropping environments was a joy to experience. Now mind you, I'm by no means a professional when it comes to soundtracks, but I genuinely don't understand the shallow and copy and pasted critiques of the music and voice acting performances. Tales of Arise knocked it out of the park. DLC Concerns I do want to share one area of concern I had in the beginning of my first playthrough for Tales of Arise, and that's honestly just dealing with the DLC that isn't cosmetic. 
And I'm going to be honest, the only DLC I felt the game had some design incentives for you to pick up was the Money or Gold DLC. Money felt extremely tight at times. I do need to state that it is very possible and not that bad to beat the game without the DLC. And you can still enjoy playing it. I did feel though that some of the consumable items were overpriced. And with fights designed to put a strain on your cure points meter, and I'm going to explain that later on, but suffice it to say, I personally felt fishing unlocked at the right time and allowed for a reliable and efficient means to farm gold without sinking an enormous amount of time. Also, one tip to help alleviate a lot of this is just don't buy armor. It's never worth the price you'll pay, and you're always going to be able to find better armor in the zone you're in, but it may be towards the end of that zone. So just explore all the nooks and crannies and save your precious money. Lastly, there is a rubber banding system in place for XP. So as you get higher level, you're going to be experiencing diminishing returns on the XP you get from monsters that are lower level for you. In effect, you can reach a point where you're getting next to nothing from monsters in your area, so do not be tempted to grind XP too often. In my normal playthrough, I never felt tempted to do this, as you're going to receive a combat bonus for chaining battles together, and if you receive a 5 stack of this bonus, then you're going to be gaining a massive bonus to uh, XP, SP, which is what you use to uh, spend on your talent points. This to me is a fun system, and if you can find a glowing enemy out in the wild, that means they're gonna give you a massive boost to this meter. So what I would do at the beginning of a zone is I would just ignore all items and resources, and I would just start chaining all the battles together that I could. After I cleared the zone, I would just let the stack drop and I would go around and pick up all the items and resources. That way I would just get everything I could from the battles. However, I don't believe the game is this finely tuned. It's just what I did and it worked out for me. So hey, there you go. Gameplay and Progression Tales of Arise is an action RPG. But the gameplay and power progression in the game heavily benefits from doing side quests, getting your food buffs, crafting your own weapons and accessories, and immersing yourself in the world as a whole. Each of your party members can equip a sword, armor, and an accessory. It's simple on the surface, but offers a wide array of depth to combat. There's also titles or talent trees that you can spend SP on obtained through subquests or combat, and these can be used to unlock invaluable arts and passive buffs that will offer you the most noticeable form of power progression. Each title that you complete will offer a completion stat bonus, and these are not to be ignored, as I felt that gaining a static plus 50 defense or offensive stat bonus was indeed noticeable with the game's balancing. As I mentioned before, I believe that if you utilize all of the resources that are available to you, you're going to have a well-balanced and fun challenge for a normal difficulty playthrough. I'm someone who is cuckoo bananas for the action RPG genre, and the interplay between the progression systems and the combat is mwah, oh it's so good. Now the major benefit for doing side quests is that they're going to award a fair bit of money and SP. In addition to this, there are some talent trees that will unlock from questing, cooking, fishing, building relationships, etc. That's why I say just explore the world of Arise as a whole, because it's going to benefit your power progression. I love these gameplay mechanics and systems. It's just that added level of excitement when I finally cook a meal with a party member that's going to unlock a new combat talent tree. The crafting system is integral to gaining power in Arise. You're going to be able to craft weapons that offer flat stat boosts, but also have elemental affinities to them that can be a game changer if you're having a difficult time with a group of enemies who, let's just say, may be weak to fire. For a normal playthrough, I didn't feel a pressing need to utilize this type of min-maxing, but I'm positive on future and more difficult playthroughs that this will be a must. Now, I want to mention, never sell your old weapons. 
That's because they can be used as future materials for stronger weapons. The true beauty of Tales of Arise progression path comes from accessories. The depth of the system allows you to create different builds for all your characters. Alfin alone has multiple ways you can build his combat style, from just focusing on let's say flat damage, to heavily stacking fire damage and becoming a glass cannon of damage. Now that's a lot of damage! This system is pretty deep as you will gather ore from mining nodes from your travels. And then you'll be able to turn that ore, depending on its level, into an item. Now if that ore is level 5, then it's going to have a flat upgrade indicative to the ore type. Then you can enhance the ore by sacrificing other minerals you've gathered to upgrade and unlock passive bonuses on the item. These are bonuses can range from defensive and offensive stat boosts, Late in the game, you can actually transfer skills from fully upgraded accessories to finely tune the item you want for each character. There is a lot of depth here, and I'm by no means a math expert, so I haven't run the numbers to see what the best min-max build is, but don't be afraid to experiment with different ones. I personally had great success by making sure Law had plus penetration bonuses as this helped in breaking or interrupting casts from enemies. Also, Renwell heavily benefits from elemental attack. And at the end, making sure Xion or Dolhalim have CP or Cure Point reduction bonuses is great as they're going to be the ones tapping into your CP gauge the most. CP is the resource you have to heal or resurrect party members in combat. This is going to be your life force, and reducing the hurt you put on using this meter is key to an easier time in Tales of Arise. One other progression path that is of note is the Artifact System. This is found from the main menu and will be passive bonuses you can equip that will offer massive bonuses. Also, if you buy the DLC, this is where you'll be able to enable or disable those features. An example of this is completing Dolhalim's advanced training ground and getting the Reckless Abandoned Artifact that increases the damage you deal and receive by 100%. Jesus. This was a gameplay changer for me, as I was already having fun in the game, but doing difficult battles with this one was a freaking blast. Oh my god, I loved it. The last system I want to mention here is Cooking Bonuses. This cannot be understated how beneficial it is. Again, be mindful of new recipes you get, as cooking them with the right party member may unlock a new talent tree. The ones I used the most in my playthrough was Rare or Up, CP Recovery Buffs, and XP Bonuses. For a normal playthrough, I personally didn't find that I needed defensive or offensive bonuses more than just the ones I listed. However, if there is a difficult boss you're fighting, then buffs such as elemental defense bonuses can definitely make your life easier. While this all sounds overwhelming and mind-boggling, it is introduced to the player in such a consumable manner that I never felt overwhelmed with the different progression and gameplay systems. Combat. Oh, that's right. It's time. Bandai Namco have knocked it out of the park with Tales of Arise and its fast-paced, high-octane, dare I say juicy combat system. I played this one on the PS5, but you will have access to normal attacks with your R1, and your face buttons will comprise of zero being jump, X, square, and triangle being special abilities or arts. As you progress through the game, you're going to be able to unlock modifiers to where when you hold L2 and hit your face buttons, you'll be able to outfit yourself with a whole new set of arts. So effectively, you can have two sets of ground arts and two sets of aerial arts on each character. This is invaluable, as if you use the same art on an enemy within four art combos, then it's going to have reduced damage. For example, I would normally do three ground arts, and if the enemy broke, I would juggle them up into the air with three aerial arts, ending with a downward smash and start the process over. The ebb and flow to combat is pristine, and it never got old through my 50 hour plus playthrough. Each character has different mechanics to work with, but for the majority, R2 is going to be dodge or block with Kasara. 
And if you time your dodges or blocks perfectly, then you'll be allowed to counterattack for some solid damage. As Alfin, you can hold in your art ability on certain abilities and exchange health to do more damage with them. Bursts of fire, it's gorgeous, I loved every second of it. And it also plays into a really nice risk versus reward gameplay system. This flame attack in exchange for health for more powerful damage on Alfin, oh, it's so good. Definitely a risk reward system that I couldn't get enough of. Chaining your attacks together is incentivized and it makes a really well balanced system for when you're chasing higher combos to pull off on enemies. In addition to these systems, you are able to hit the weaknesses of certain enemies or perform high enough combos to where you put the enemy in a break status. When this happens, you're able to knock them up into the air and hold them right in the palm of your hand. Mm, it's so good. I like it a lot. Now, as you and your allies fight, you're going to gain a special attack bonus that can be seen on the bottom left of the screen. When this is filled, you can hit the corresponding directional button and either enter into a state of invulnerability, negating all damage received, and unleash an ability on Alphim that will immediately break or stun the enemies, or even be utilized to deal with monster-specific hazards. As an example, if you're fighting an enemy that is charging and just trampling you and your team, Kisara's special move will break the charge and allow for some massive damage. Law can break armored enemies, Rinwell interrupts casts, Dolholim stops fast foes, and Xion decimates flying units. Now there is one gameplay feature that I have found a lot of misinformation on or just not enough information, and surprisingly that is Mystic Arts. This is a fantastic gameplay mechanic, but when you do enough perfect dodges or you just deal a lot of damage, you will enter into an empowered state, and at this point you will not have any charge for any arts you pull off. However, if you use an art, then you will be able to hold down two of the face buttons and on PlayStation it would be X, square, or triangle, anything other than jump, and then at this point you will be able to do a mystic art. This does a crap ton of damage, but it will consume the rest of your over limit gauge. The flow to combat is excellent, and though some have criticized it for being too chaotic, I'm going to be honest here, I never felt it. I thought there were times when fighting some of the challenges in the training ground that I was being heavily encouraged to be mindful of my position so I could see the other enemy units and what they were doing on the field. But I found that to be more solid game design and not so much of a concern. Also the training grounds are a great place to learn how to play all the party members with no risk or penalty. I loved it and spent a ton of time delving into the higher challenges. JRPGs can be long, and while I always value an incredible cast and an endearing story, the combat literally never got old throughout my entire playthrough. I love tackling challenges at the level they were given, and for some of the super zoogles that were out there, I love taking them on when I was around 5 levels lower. It's so good, and I can't recommend this game enough to connoisseurs of action RPG combat. Tips and Tricks now, as my discussion and thoughts on Arise are coming to a close, I want to leave you all with some tips I wish I'd have known a little sooner in the game. Don't sell armor. You're always going to find better armor in the wild, and you'll find it before you need to purchase an upgrade. Don't sell your weapons. They're going to be used as materials later for better weapons. When you break an enemy, you can see a target reticle that will begin to fill up with a blue line as you do more damage to them. If you can max this out, then you can do a special dual art with your team for massive damage. It can be useful to know when you should press the attack, at least I thought so at least. Collect everything you see along the way. It's going to make subquests instantly complete sometimes. It's great. If there's a high demand for it, I can make a dedicated video on more tips and tricks alone for this game, but these are the ones that I think are going to set you up for the best success in the game. Let everyone know your tips without spoilers down in the comments. Conclusion Games like Tales of Arise don't come around all the time. However, there are still tales to be told. I'm so thankful for the time I've been able to spend with this game. As of the writing of this review, I'm gearing up for a new Game Plus run. 
Truly a joy to play, and I can't recommend it enough. Bandai Namco has delivered with this most recent installment in the beloved Tales series. But how about you? Have you played Tales of Arise yet? Are you new to the series? Let me know down in the comments. Like this video if you liked it, subscribe and hit that notification bell for more JRPG and Tales of Arise content. And until then, I'll see you all next time.